I seem to remember in my experience at the time, ladies were not terribly um, forthcoming as far as comedy was concerned. They, they would appear, they, the established ladies would appear dressed beautifully. Um, and it, was, it seemed to be a sort of indication that they weren't prepared either metaphorically or realistic to fall on their asses. And Prue was. I mean, Prue came in a pair of trousers and, uh, and a sweater and, and, if you like, was one of the lads. And you have had a lot of experience of treating abnormalities in patients going through the male menopause. I certainly have. <laughs> if I'm going to tell you about some of the things I've seen, you'd better clear the court. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that will be necessary. After all, we're all men of the world. Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she can play all sorts of things, can't she? And she does it with such conviction, and, and she's just so different. She's got this eye for detail, observation, and I think she thinks an awful lot about the character she's playing, and she goes into the finest little detail about, you know, a brooch or, or the right sort of clothes and the right walk and the right hair and, and everything. It's just a bit buttery with my skin. <laughs> I think I need something more, more topazy for my colouring, you know. More tonal. <laughs> Look, have you got... Uh, have you got Cosmopolitan there? Well, page 42. You see Burt Reynolds? <laughs> well, there's a girl standing behind him looking at James Kahn. That sort of colour. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, ir irritatingly obsessed with, with, with detail. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, maddeningly so. What I like about Prue is that she's picky. And one or two people said to me, she's a bit too picky. I said, no, 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 she's the right degree of picky. I like picky people. I want them to worry about whether to do it this way or that way. Because I think if you're being well paid and you've got a good script, it's worth, worth the worry. Show him how to do it, doll. All right, well, you watch, Ginge. The great thing is to keep talking to distract their attention. Tell yeah. a gripping story, you see. You got a wallet on you? Yeah. Fountain pen? Yeah. Wearing braces? And I remember in this particular episode, um, she had to teach Ginger and I, that was in Lavender, and I played Norma, to pickpocket. I say to you, uh, my uncle was pruning roses the other day when a flying saucer landed on the lawn right next to him. Two bright red spiders the size of footballs got out and started eating the grass. Uncle got hold of the hose and turned the water on them. There was a hissing of steam, and they made a funny noise. <laughs> OK, so we can cheat it on, on, on television. We can do that, and we've got whatever it was somewhere else. Not Prue. No, she learned how to be a pickpocket. There's your wallet. And your fountain pen. And your red braces. That's amazing. I've never known. Mm -hmm. It would have come to you eventually. Did I do it right in the, in the, in the series? Oh, good. Oh, well, I probably did. Perhaps somebody in the, in the crew knew somebody who will show you. My mother's able to play in different periods and in different styles because of that specificity and because of that love of detail, which means that she just isn't, she just isn't being pronounced scales in another thing that happens to be in different frocks. You know, she's, she's got a sense of place and a sense of style that, that um, make people believe what she's doing, and so it makes it easier for them to laugh and also cry. I think I'll dig up that old fruitless apple tree by Grebe and tell everybody I found the Ark of the Covenant in its roots or a first folio of Shakespeare. Jealousy. Nobody's allowed to see anything, of course. Definitely jealousy. I was saying to Benji only this morning, Lucio finds it so difficult to grow old gracefully. And like all really good actors, she's massively insecure and uh, she's self-doubting and she's quite personally shy. Am I so very unattractive, Dennis? You, Mim? Never. Do I appear awfully bossy to you? <laughs> you don't have to tell me. It's not compulsory, you know. Mim, you're all right. And the funny thing about Bruce socially is all she ever does apologise. You know, I always encourage her. I always say, let's have 20 minutes of apology now, just to get the evening off to a good start. Um, but if she wasn't quite so apologetic and so alarmed that she might in some way offend someone by being too assertive. She'd be a wonderful director. I'm just talking about technically, it will help, dare I say, the comedy, if you are not aware of the effect you are having on her or what she thinks succulent means. You're just, you're just preoccupied. What, what, 
what, what succulent, don't say it. It, it. it has more impact if, 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 if you are completely unaware mm -hmm. and, and if you don't look at her. She does a workshop called Getting the Laughs with the Words, which means that if a part or a speech contains a line that could be funny and you're not getting it, you're not doing your job right. I do enjoy teaching. You learn such a lot from teaching. I, I enjoy teaching very much. Say sorry first. Sorry first. If you say, say sorry first, in a reasoned, with a reasoned inflection, it spoils a joke when he says sorry first. Say sorry first, sorry first. Can you hear what I'm saying? It's better. I'm sorry, it's just better. And, and you, you it's are. really quite gratifying when people come bouncing up to you in the coffee break and saying, nobody has ever said that to me, either during my training or during my working life, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Perfect, except I don't think you, I long for you not to pause before the word. <laughs> Which suggests to me that in a very limited way that one has got something to teach and that one should, one should do that, one should transmit it before one dies because it may be useful and, and it's important. She's incredibly supportive to other actors. Um, I remember when I had to um, drive in the test graphics and I am an appalling driver. <coughs> what was that? Mother, there's a baby in the car. I know it's ours. So I had Prunella and a baby in the car, so I was really quite sort of nervous about it. So I said to Prunella, listen, I don't want to scare you in any way, but this is the handbrake. Use it if you want to. Over there, right by the entrance in the trolleys. See? Easy. <laughs> so we were driving along, and she knew that I was nervous, and she just kept saying, excellent, excellent. Excellent, excellent driving, excellent, excellent. And it really gave me so much confidence having Brunella say excellent all the time. <gasps> oh. You didn't put your hand up again, Sarah, dear. That one creep up on you too, did it? Yes, it did. And if I had put my hand up, either I'd have stuck a needle up my nose or got your curtains covered in snot. <laughs> I think there are, there are things about uh, uh, Prue which uh, emerged very strongly in, in the character she played in After Henry. Um, particularly, I think, in, in regard to her relationship with her mother. I mean, Prue's mother was nothing like that lady, but there was a kind of ambivalent relationship. I am not going to have my mother upstaged by Vera Poling. What? I'm going to go along at lunchtime and get her that dress she wants from Jonquil. That's extremely generous of you. Well, it's my birthday. I can do anything I like on my birthday, can't I, Russell? You certainly can. Even go against the habits of a lifetime and be nice to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, after Henry, was, I suppose, nearer to me than any other part I've ever played. It, uh, you know, her, her anxiety and her incompetence and, and, and so on. Stylistically, Simon had written it in, in a, a very realistic, naturalistic way, and one, of course, went with that, and I think that's what the essence of the series was. Right, Mrs. France, you have two minutes on the life and work of Dr. Henry France, starting now. What colour was Dr. France's hair? Light brown. What colour were his eyes? Sort of hazel. How tall was he? Five foot eleven and a quarter. <laughs> he always said after a day in the surgery he was down five foot ten. She is a consummate actress. I mean, an actress rather than a, a stand-up or a, a comedian. You know, in other words, whatever part she plays, be it totally serious or a, a funny character, she will think, what is this person like? And she'll get inside their head. What was his favourite food? <coughs> like fish. Plain over so just grilled with a green salad up on the musk. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> it helps. Please, stop crying. <laughs> it's all right, Russell. I've started, so I'll finish. <laughs> I've seen Prue do so many things well, but the one I thought that was quite extraordinary was when she basically did Queen Elizabeth II, both on stage, and I think I even liked her performance better on television. It was just miraculous, that performance, because without any disrespect at all, she caught the, what seemed to be the essence of, of Her Majesty, and also brought out a wonderful humor that one suspects is lying there, and you know, we don't see a great deal. So I thought that was perhaps the best thing I've ever seen her do. The blasphemy factor when one walked on was the sort of shock uh, of the audience um, uh, including a very clever costume and a very 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 good wig 
was uh, was very was gratifying, great fun. What's astonishing about um, Prunella when she plays the Queen is that somehow she's more like the Queen than the Queen herself. It's a fine face, though he looks as if he could do with some fresh air. Who is he? His name is Andrea Franceschi. He was Chancellor of Venice. Oh, we were in Venice two years ago. Unusual face. So, now that it's a fake, what are you planning to do with it? Put it out for the bin men. Uh, my mother was given a CBE a few years ago and it was presented by the Queen, who leant over to drop it round her neck and said rather charmingly, I expect you think you ought to be doing this. On stage I could believe I was the Queen. And indeed, I did get a letter once from one of her security men who'd worked for her for eight years, and he said when I walked on stage, he actually got to his feet had to stop himself, which was very gratifying. So that if one comes across a painting with the right background and pedigree, Sir Anthony, it must be hard, I imagine, even inconceivable, to think that it is not what it claims to be. And even supposing someone in such circumstances did have suspicions, they would be chary about voicing them. Easier to leave things as they are, stick with the official attribution, rather than let the cat out of the bag and say, here we have a fake. I still think the word fake is inappropriate, ma'am. If something is not what it claims to be, what is it? An enigma? That is, I think, the sophisticated answer. But Brunella has an enormous range, of course. A performance. This, of course, is because she and I, and uh, those uh, when we were young, us a lot, uh, we went to rep, you see, repertory company. We played part after part, all different parts, perhaps 12 a year. And so uh, it gave her a range, which I think I've got as well. I mean, we all read with Shakespeare, we do. She plays the Queen of England, she plays Victoria, and she plays, of course, Civil Faulty, which is a marvellous character part for her. Not, I used to think, difficult for her to play, because she's had all that experience. And that's how she'll rem remember for Tom Good, she'll remember for Civil Faulty, and that's how it is, I'm afraid. She's never lived it down, really, has she? I mean, people continue to remind her of, of that. Uh, I don't know whether that gets frustrating, but um, she's... Um yeah, it was certainly very brilliant in it. Things that depress, depress me about, about Sibyl is when somebody comes up and says, Oh, Sybil Fawlty, you'll never have a better part. And if I really thought that, um, I, I, I think I'd, uh, I'd give up the business. To have given such uh, a, a, an extraordinary life to a character which it would be so easy to play one-dimensionally, I mean, you have to say that Fawlty Towers is, is a, an incredible achievement and, and always will stand as one. Well. Well, I, and indeed, I have had in many parts that are better parts as such. Though I haven't been in many better scripts, if you see what I'm saying. And don't let it loose in the garden. He'll come back in the house. Can't we get you a mastermind, Sybil? Next contestant, Sybil Forty from Torquay. Special subject, the bleeding obvious. I wasn't going to let it go in the garden. I... Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll take it away. Let it go. Give it its freedom. You can't do that, Basil. He wouldn't be able to defend himself. He's a rat, isn't he? Domesticated, aren't you? Well, you're domesticated. You do all right. <laughs> Look, he's not going to get mugged by a gang of field mice, is he? Basil, he's Manuel's pet. We have a duty to it. Perhaps we could find a home for him. All right, I'll put an ad in the papers. A wanted kind home for enormous savage rodent. <laughs> Answers to the name of Sybil. Mm -hmm.